We got several different stories from several different media outlets, guys. It's time for another episode of the World News Round. Let's go, guys. <laughs> Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. This is Regan Lee here with another episode of the World's News Round, where I cover several different news stories from outside the UK, all in one video. Usually about an hour, sometimes a bit longer. And we start here with CNN with the headline of Enlist or Die. Fear, looming famine and the deadly ultimatum swells the ranks of Sudan's paramilitary forces. And <clears throat> those who have been following my channel for a while know that I've covered... Uh, very, various topics with regards to Sudan. I've even done videos here on the actual YouTube channel uh, very back in my early days as well about the about a bit about the history about why Sudan is in the conflict that he is in and um, it's pretty much a case of obviously if you are a man in Sudan and you and you don't choose to en enlist uh, under under them you'll be pretty much be killed and um, uh, last, uh, I had a, uh, there was the last last story that I covered really on either on Snowflake's Corner or World News Round. Uh, we recorded up to 25 million Sudanese were suffering from famine, starvation, and, and uh, all sorts of problems. The country is in crisis; it's in, it's in absolute crisis. But <clears throat> the world is turned; it's not even paying attention to what's happening in Sudan in any way shape or form mainstream medias are not covering enough of it whatsoever while of course yeah our all eyes seem to be on what's happening in gaza and what's happening with the war in ukraine many people are, are obviously not too fussed about Su sudan's situation although there has been more coverage of Haiti recently which i'm, I'm glad there's bit, becoming a bit more coverage but still um sudan has been going on in this crisis for uh, almost a year and um and it doesn't appear to be any help, any hope in sight. And people, the people there continue to suffer. And as they continue to suffer, more and more Sudanese flee their country, which means they have to migrate somewhere, where they will migrate to their neighbouring countries, who some of them are in conflicts of their own. Some of those uh, will uh, migrate to Egypt, looking to cross over to the Mediterranean, into Europe, because they have <clears throat> to, for a better chance, a better way of life, because their surrounding areas are on the where they are is just full of conflict and and the climate is becoming uh, becoming more and more difficult to live in as well because that's playing a factor into 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 this as well so there are, and obviously if you're not if you don't want to enlist in and get yourself involved in this war well you're going to flee your country aren't you so uh, there's also that as well so there are lots of reasons for people not to stay in Sudan <coughs> so it's it's and it there seems to be no no end in sight at the moment, and um, I've said this before and I've said this again, guys. Where where is this? Where is the uh, where is the support? Where 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 is you know where is the rest of the nations? Where is the world leaders looking to do something about this? Again, no way to be seen. So in mid December, a powerful paramilitary rapid support forces the RAS swept into Sudan's central Al Jazeera. Uh, Al uh, Jazeera state known as the country's ba uh, bread basket with an ultimatum enlist or die since then the militia group has sought to use uh, food as a weapon withholding supplies from, a hung from the hungry in a bid to coerce men and boys to join its ranks according to over three dozen witnesses the RSF has been battling Suzetanese armed forces SAF for control of the country since a civil war broke out between the two rival factions in April last year both forces have been accused of killing civilians CNN reported last year exposed an RSF-led campaign to enslave men and women and other atrocities by the paramilitary group and its allied militias in Sudan's western Darfur region, an area already scarred by what has been widely described as the 21st century first genocide. There have been many reports of the RSF uh, committing such atrocities. There have been many reports I have seen. <coughs> Now, a CNN investigation found that almost 700 men and 65 children have been forcibly recruited by the RSF over the past three months in Jazeera State alone. Many of the victims were identified by witnesses, survivors and family members. CNN cross-checked their names with residents uh, from their communities to get details of what happened in each case. The fighting has limited communication and restricting access to the media, making gathering accounts like these incredibly challenging. CNN was independently able to corroborate the identities of 750 people swept up by the RSF press gangs in Jazeera. 
Of those, at least 600, including 50 boys under 18, joined RSF in Eastern Jazeera, in many cases driven by hunger. Witness testimonies received. Another 150, including 15 boys, were forcibly recruited in Western Jazeera. Many of the men previously worked as farmers or traders. They, they were just thrown right in. The RSF forcibly recruiting people uh, to, to keep to bolster their numbers and keep them up in this in this conflict. Oh god, what is this? This is footage showing the RS soldiers humiliating men from the village in the Jazeera state. Apparently, that's pretty despicable. <coughs> Eyewitnesses detail a range of cohesive methods employed by RSF to compel individuals to join their ranks, including intimidation, torture, uh, summary execution, and the withholding of food and uh, medicine. CNN has obtained and verified two videos from residents of a village in Jazeera who described an RSF attack in early January. In one video, an RSF soldier, identified by his headgear and the insignia of his military fatigue, declares they have captured the village. <coughs> yeah, they're pretty much told if they don't, if they don't join, they'll kill them. Pretty much is what is the gist of this, guys. And this is this is the, they they don't have a choice. They're stuck in this situation as well. You don't get you don't get a say in this. In another other RSF soldiers, again identified by their fatigues and headgear, can be calling the village men dogs before gunshots filled the air. The RSF soldiers can be seen humiliating the men, forcing them to prostrate themselves. Then they execute six of them. According to three of those who survived, the men have refused to enlist, the survivors told CNN. Two other witnesses from the village corroborated their account. Wow, they didn't get... Wow, I thought they would be killed. I said soldiers looking to swell militia ranks targeted a different village on February the 27th, uh, witnesses said. The militia tried to recruit 20 young men from the village, eyewitnesses, survivors and families of victims said. When the residents refused, they set up a base in the village, unleashing what the witness described as a campaign of terror. Homes were looted and supermarkets and food warehouses were set on fire before soldiers took off with over 30 stolen vehicles. <coughs> Three dozen iron witnesses CNN spoke to from across Jazeera, including survivors and the families of victims, say refusing RSF ultimatum comes at a cost of food, home and safety. CNN is not naming the villages and most of the people due to fear of RSF reprisals. And in response to CNN's request for comment for this story, RSF spokesperson Nadir Seed Ahmed provided a written statement denying that hunger and fear are being wielded by the SRF to force recruitment and describing such claims as baseless. The RSF absolutely does not need forcibly to recruit youths, Seed Ahmed said, as it has hundreds of thousands of fighters, supporters throughout Sudan who are ready to fight in their ranks, they're stating. So um, <clears throat> that's obviously the country Sudan there, for those just from a geography perspective. So Khartoum is the capital, um, which which the RSF do have are still back. They've had control of it for quite some time, but they have. But it seems like the. But they are losing a little bit of ground on that, and then you can see there where uh, highlighted where the uh, Al Jazeera state where they which they control there, and this source is from the International Management Working Group, the United Nations Office for Coordination and Humanitarian Affairs. For those wondering where uh, where this is from. Jazeera state in central Sudan fills much of the country's population of around 48 million. According to United Nations data located just south of Khartoum, Sudan's uh, capital state is also home to one of the largest irrigation systems in the world. The Jazeera scheme that just before the war, Jazeera produced almost half of the Sudan's total wheat and housed most of the country's grain reserves. That grain and the capacity to grow and harvest more are now in the hands of the RSF, where they entrench and occupy vast swathes of Jazeera's farm land. Whoever controls the zero controls the food production in the country, said Alex said Alex Dawal, an expert on the Horn of Africa and ex, ex uh, exclusive director of the World Peace Foundation, about what he called the catastrophic hunger crisis the conflict has spawned. Mohamed uh, Baswani, a lawyer from the African Center for Justice and Peace Studies, told CNN that RSF cohesive and violent tactics were akin to enforce labor system. <clears throat> people need to survive they have no other choice no one to complain to if you don't kill for them you will be arrested said one of the RSF uh, he said of the RSF methods reports of RSF fought in Sudanese men and children to join their ranks through intimidation torture and withholding food and aid are deplorable the war must stop and those responsible for atrocities must be held accountable said US Special Envoy for Sudan's Tom Pedro and X formerly known as Twitter in response to CNN's reporting 
with no sign of the conflict abating fears of impending famine are gathering pace. This is a health worker measures the circumstances of a Sudanese child's arm at a clinic at a transit center for refugees in Redick, South Sudan. This was on the 13th of April. The World Food Programme, the WFP, warned earlier this month that more than 25 million people, we talked about this, people across Sudan and the neighbourhood South Sudan and Chad were trapped in a spiral of de deteriorating food security. These most in need of help are stuck in areas which can't be reached because of relentless violence and interference by the warring parties, the news release added. Around 220,000 severely malnourished children and more than 7,000 new mothers could die in Sudan if urgent assistance does not reach them in the coming months. The UN Office of Coordination and Humanitarian Affairs, the OCHA, said in an update on Wednesday. Some 3.7 million children are suffering from malnutrition across the country, it stated, adding that there are already reports of child death, deaths related to malnutrition, including in Dufar. Uh, Dufar. The, profit, the non-profit Safer Children Group, um, part of a humanitarian organisation working in Sudan, said that since the conflict erupted last April, food supply had severely decreased both in production and distribution, while prices rose by 45% under a year. The UN has appealed for £2.7 billion pounds this year to meet Sudan's humanitarian needs. So far, only 5% of that figure has been given. It's £2.7 billion. Pounds. That's a lot of money to get for the UN to get. This is uh, displaced people fear, uh, fleeing from Jazeera State who arrived in Jatawa in the East Worn Town, uh, East Worn Torn Sudan on December the 22nd. There. <coughs> Those who have fled, fled from there. The RSF's grip on food supply is only part of the broadening system of cohesion in Jahawa, witness accounts indicate. On the 3rd of January, a 21-year-old fruit, uh, fruit trader from Western Jazeera was on his way back to the state when an SAF-controlled area of the north when the RSF got hold of him. They accused me of cooperating with Sudanese army intelligence and only released me following the intervention of one of my friends who has joined the RSF. The trader who did not want to be named for safety reasons told CNN. If he wasn't for it, yeah, if he were, if he didn't have a, somebody who was part of the RSF, he would have been stuck in that situation. And could have been worse for him. <clears throat> but his friend couldn't guarantee safety going forward. The trader said, he advised me to join the RSF with him so that I could provide food for my children. He told CNN, indicating that that's what friends have done. But I completely rejected this idea. He has since escaped the state and is living in an undisclosed location within the country. <clears throat> Another man who owns a circus farm in the same area, Sadiq Farouk, said he was tortured on his farm in December 28th, days after the RSF uh, consolidated power in the state capital. One Madi Farouk, who spoke uh, to CNN from a safe location outside the country, said, They tied my hands and legs uh, with rope and pushed me, punched me, pushed me to the ground and they started hitting me. Uh, Farouk alleged the RSF soldiers who accused him of associating with the SAF then stood on his face with their military boots on. It's so tough, the movement of the boots in your ears, your ears uh, start whistling and after a while you become numb to the beatings. They are people without mercy, he told CNN. Four other members of his family have since been killed trying to resist the RSF, he said. He also recounted the experience of a man from Khartoum who has sought refugee in a village near his in Jazeera when the war, war first broke out. <clears throat> in April 2023, he has since been coerced into joining the RSF. When the RSF entered the state uh, this December, they stole his car, for except. The RSF told him that they would only return his car if he worked for them, for called. Till now, he has been made to work as a driver for them. He hasn't even got his car back. More than a dozen witnesses also accused the RSF of exploiting a month-long communication blackout in the state to extort money from locals. As a result of the blackout, the parliamentary group controls access to the internet in, Jaz in Jazeera, charging residents money to use SpaceX Starlink satellite internet system for online services, including bank transfers. Against their will, people. It's acting like vicious gangs, the RSF is what this report is, is coming across as. And we've talked about what um, I've talked about before about some of the atrocities that the RSF have, have been accused of doing already. And while they have denied this, it's, 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 it's not going away, these stories. The RSF charged $3 an hour to let people use the internet. Uh, and as far as bank transfers are concerned, they're cutting a, they're taking a cut of 20% of the value of the amount that someone sends to you abroad, one witness said. They deliver it to people in cash because uh, they are the only ones now in the state of Jazeera who have cash from the money they loot from banks, shops and many villages. 
The quick quo pro demanded by the ISF becomes clearer as weeks pass. Residents say, I went to a group of villagers to file a complaint with the district commander about the theft of cars and money from the village. Said one witness. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> the commander's response was, get the youth of the village to enlist with us so they can protect you. And this is enforced enlistment. New SRS recruits are being rewarded with food and aid loot from others, uh, more witnesses say. Hala al Karib, regional director of the non-profit strategic initiative for women in the Horn of Africa, told CNN, What the RSF doing is in Jazeera is turning self-sufficient communications into IDPs who are relying on aid and downgrading them into enslaved people into their own lands. It's precisely similar to what they did in Rafgal Darfar 20 years ago and got away with. Children are especially vulnerable to RSF exploitation, al Karib said, and their recruitment will make uh, demobilization process more difficult. CNN shared its findings with UN Special Reporter for Contemporary Slavery, Tamara Akbar, who said the recruitment of young men and children in exchange for food and safety amounts uh, to forced labour from the worst form in cases of children and amounts to contemporary slavery under international law. After nearly a year of war, UN Children Agency, UCEF, estimates that about 19 million Sudanese children are out of school. While several videos from across Sudan showing ISF child soldiers have been posted on social media since the beginning of the war, CNN has now been able to confirm the recruitment of 65 of them in Jazeera since mid-December, with each report independently collaborated by locals from villages concerned. Similar reports have emerged from other parts of the country. CNN has been able to confirm a handful of cases at Ottoman and Khartoum. When the ISF moved in Jazeera in mid-December, it marked its first step in what appeared to be a systematic destruction of the country's uh, agram infrastructure. It's also worse than the country's massive internal displacement crisis since the state had given shelter to hundreds of thousands of fleeing fighting elsewhere. In December the 20th, the WFP, which had set up aid hubs and warehouses in Wad Medi after fighting broke out in Khartoum last April, was forced to temporarily pause distribution in Jazeera. Lenny Kazin, head of communications for WFP in Sudan, told CNN. In under a week, uh, as Kinsey said, a warehouse containing more than 2,500 metric tons of life-saving food, including pulses, solanum, vegetable oil and nutrition su supplements, enough stock to feed nearly 1.5 million severely, uh, severely food insecure people for one month in Jazeera State. They were looted by elements associated with the RSF. Just, 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 just taking anything they want now. In response to CNN's request for comment on the allegation, RSF spokesperson Sid Ahmed said the World Food Programme's aid warehouse were looted by hungry residents deprived of humanitarian aid and called on the UN to launch an investigation. CNN spoke to several locals who said most warehouses containing food aid in Jazeera were looted in the first four weeks of the RSF occupation. Since entering Jazeera, the RSF leaders have been denying the looting, theft and incidents of murder and rape, attributing them to criminals, a witness told CNN. But as an eyewitness to what happened in our village, can say those who commit all these atrocities were wearing RSF uniforms. And this is um, civilians fleeing the conflict in Sudan, waiting for asylum registration procedures in Rex, South Sudan on December the 18th. This was last year. In a report you know, to what the government, uh, Omar, governor of the Jazeera scheme, uh, Sheen Rehabilitation Project, detailed what he said the ISF stole, what he broke into his headquarters on January the 18th. The list reviewed by CNN includes everything associated with agriculture infrastructure from tra tractors to seeds, fertilizer, and even warehouses full of food. A prominent leader in the Jazeera and Al Bahiki Farmer Alliance, who declined to be named for security reasons, told CNN, now the fate of Jazeera's agriculture has become unknown. Eyewitnesses told CNN that Wild Madi Central Market 2 was looted and set on fire just days after the ISF took over the city in a post video posted on social media. Due located to the area around the market, a man wearing RSF fatigues boasts about the damage of fraud, about the damage, I can't say that word, waltz, waltz by his forces. And they said that one Mendy cannot be taken over. Look now, satellite images from December 22 shows fire damage to the market. The Wild the Horn of Africa expert told CNN, given the dire food situation, what is happening would constitute a reckless famine crime. It is a famine crime, but like, this, like we're, we're, we're reading this, we're hearing about this, not just from CNN, but I've heard, you know, from Al Jazeera, from Middle East and I. We're here, we know these stories are happening, we know these things are happening in Sudan. And the UN is aware of this, but there's no, there doesn't appear to be anybody who wants to try and do something to de-escalate de these this situation and it's like nobody it, nobody generally cares guys this is the thing that really upsets me nobody generally cares about what's happening here 
7 million face starvation. The damage to Zazira's agriculture infrastructure only worsened the situation in the rest of Sudan. In January, Mendes Sands Frontiers, or Doctors Without Borders, reported that at the Zamzam camp for displaced people in the hard-hit North Darfur region, west of the country, at least one child is dying every two hours from starvation. One child dying every two hours from starvation. Sudan is facing the worst hunger levels ever recorded during its October-February harvest season, according to research published last month by the Clinogenical Institute, an independent think tank. It forecasts that the severity and scale of hunger in the coming uh, Lens season, mid-2024, will be catastrophic and calls for urgent large-scale assistance. According to the most likely scenario based on its research, around 7 million people could face catastrophic hunger by June 2024, with mass starvation being the prospect. Um, so it says here, conflict-driven hunger grips Sudan. Around 7 million people, or about 1 in 7 Sudanese, are likely to face catastrophic hunger by June to September 24, according to the International Affairs Think Tank, uh, Clinogenical, fighting between the companies of rapid support forces and mandatory group. Um, since April 2020, it severely disrupted agricultural production and food access to civilians. Um, this, um, let me see if I can, if you guys, I don't know if I can, if it's possible to bring this uh, graph up. I can't bring it up, unfortunately. But um, it sta it shows there that um, the it's in emergency there. 69% are in emergency. 15% uh, is catastrophic. 10% in crisis, 4.9% is stressed, and only 1.1% of people are on minimal in that situation, guys. Only 1.1%. The RSF presence effectively prevents farmers from harvesting their crops. Uh, Annette of uh, Hoffman, the author of the report, told CNN. The harvest was badly needed to compensate the massive production losses that already occurred due to the fighting in other states. The RSF violent advances in Jazeera State, their target destruction of warehouses, Sudan's gene bank and irritation system will inevitably further exaggerate Sudan's massive food shortages, he said. Those hampering life-saving aid must be held responsible for the famine they caused. The UN Food and Agriculture Organization also emerged immediate and collective action to avert and implement the humanitarian catastrophe. Restoring crops and livestock production and a livelihood of two Three quarters of the population is a top humanitarian priority, is said in its 2024 humanitarian response plan. Uh, De Waal highlighted the very immediate consequences of the RSF constricting farmers and traders as fighters amid the hunger, hunger crisis. Who's going to cultivate them? You're finished, he said. As one farmer who asked not to be named for fear of RSF returns and summed it up, it is an international act uh, to starve the people. It is. It is because um, the international community could do is is not doing anything with regards to this. They know what's happening in here in Sudan, guys. They know what's happening here in Sudan. They do know, and they're to, and they're not doing anything about it. They really are not. Um, it's just just um, you know people are more concerned about their own well-being than the well-being of others. Um, and it's incredibly frustrating. It really, really is frustrating, guys. Um, I mean, I could scream and swear and shout um, on the situation because so many people, you know, literally a child is dying every two hours in Sudan. But um, they've got to... The, the, what needs to... There needs to be some kind of military... The internet, not military, but... It, International cooperation needs to be done to ensure that at least food supplies and aids are getting to the people that they need, and that those who are responsible need to be held accountable for stopping stopping the aid, medicine, and aid, and food that needed to be for the people. <clears throat> at least, of course, we want to cease fire and want the uh, bloodshed to stop, but I don't see any sign of that happening anytime soon, guys. And it's it's incredibly disheartening to say the least when we talk about it. And this will not be the last time I'll be covering uh, Sudan, as I'm sure you guys are aware. So we move on from that uh, to uh, an article here from Al Jazeera. So um, this was recorded on Tuesday, the 26th of March, 2024, just for reference, guys, at around um, 8.30 to 8 o'clock a.m. time of this record, just for those who are wondering. And um, 
The UN Security Council here, guys, uh, they demanded an immediate Gaza ceasefire as the US abstains once again. So the UNSC called for a lasting and sustainable ceasefire in the Israel war with Hamas in Gaza and the release of all cap uh, cap captives. So all captives, they are requiring all captives to be released from both sides and a sustainable ceasefire are from Israel and obviously from Hamas. That would really um, just try and de-escalate the situation in, uh, that's happening right now. Um, basically, we've just gone from one crisis to another. And obviously, we, we, we've talked many, many times about the situation that's taking place within Gaza. And once again, the US abstains. Um, abstaining, I mean, it's just... It's not a good image for Biden. Like, he, 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 you know, it's not a good image, you know, for him. It's not not good for him. It really is not. Um, I understand America's position and how much they care about Israel, but it's not looking good for them, guys. Um, but um, it's not, this, this, demanding this ceasefire from the UNSC, it's not going to, it's not going to, I don't feel like it's going to push, it's going to make a difference, if I'm honest, guys, as much as I want it to. So the United Nations Security Council, uh, UNSC, demanded an immediate ceasefire between Israel and the Pal Palestinian group Hamas in the Gaza Strip and the release of all hostages as the United States abstains from the vote. The remaining 14 council members voted in favour of the resolution, which was uh, proposed by the 10 elected members of the council. There was a round of applause in the Crown Chamber after the vote on Monday. Well, I'm glad you are guys are in agreement, but it's, it's not going to change anything. But this is this is kind of how I feel about uh, the if the houses of parliament if they all voted in favour of a of a ceasefire all the uh, political parties I'd be much more happier but they didn't we can't seem to agree on that which is quite pathetic if I'm honest the resolution calls for an immediate ceasefire for the Muslim fasting month of Ramadan which ends in two weeks and also demands the release of all hostages seized in the Hamas led attack on southern Israel on October the seventh. The bloodbath has continued far too long, said uh, Amir Benjamin, the ambassador for our Algeria, from our Algeria, the Arab Blog Security Council member and a sponsor of the resolution. Finally, Security Council is shouldering its responsibilities. The US have repeatedly blocked Security Council resolutions that put pressure on Israel, but it has increasingly shown frustration with its ally as civilian casualties mount and the US UN warns of impending famine in Gaza. Speaking after the vote, the U.S. Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield blamed Hamas for the delay in passing for a ceasefire resolution. Why? Uh, uh, why is it Hamas's fault here? Yes, we know Hamas, yeah, caused this atrocity in, on October the 7th. Well, why are we blaming Hamas here? We did not agree with everything with the resolution, uh, which she said was the reason why the U.S. abstained. Certain key edits, edits were ignored, including our request to aid a condemnation of Hamas, Thomas Grinfield said. Uh, she stressed that the release of Israeli captives would lead to an increase in humanitarian aid supplies going to the besieged coastal enclave. The White House said the final resolution did not have the language in the US considers essential in, and it's abstained and does not represent a shift in policy. Uh, but Israel Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's office said U.S. failure to veto the resolution is a clear retreat from its previous position and would hurt war efforts against Hamas as well as efforts to release Israeli captives held in Gaza. Yeah, of course you would say that. His office also said Netanyahu will not be sending high-level delegations to Washington, D.C. in light of the new U.S. position. U.S. President Joe Biden has requested to miss Israeli officials to discuss Israeli plans for a ground invasion of Rafka in southern Gaza, where more than one million displaced Palestinians are sheltering. White House spokesperson John Kirby said the U.S. was disappointed by Netanyahu's decision. We are disappointed that they won't be coming to Washington, D.C. to allow us to have fulsome conversations about the viable alternatives uh, to them going in and around Rafka, Kirby told reporters. He said uh, senior U.S. officials will still meet for separate talks with Israeli Defense Minister Yovah Gallic, who is currently in Washington, on issues including the captivity, humanitarian aid and protecting civilians in Rafka. Last week, Netanyahu promised to defy U.S. appeals and expand Israel's military campaign to Rafka, even without its allies' support. Al Jazeera's diplomatic editor, James Bays, said the vote is still a very significant development. After almost six months, the vote, almost unanimously, has demanded a lasting and immediate ceasefire in Gaza. The U.S. has, has used its veto three times, Bays said. This time, the U.S. let, it, let this pass. The resolutions of the Security Council are international law, and they are always seen as binding on all members of the United States, he added. 
The UN Security Ter uh, Secretary General Antonio Guterres posted on X, the resolution must be implemented and in that failure would be unforgivable. Well, how are you going to force Israel to, to do this? The vote came amid international calls to bring the nearly six month long conflict to end as Israeli forces pummel Gaza and humanitarian conditions in the besieged strip reaching critical levels. More than 90% of Gaza's 2.3 million residents have been displaced and, caught, and conditions under Israeli siege and bombardment have pushed Gaza to the brink of famine, the UN said. More than 32,000 Palestinians have been killed in Israel's assault since October 7th, mostly women and children, according to Palestinian health authorities. Israel began its military offensive in Gaza after Hamas led an attack on southern Israel on October 7th, killing 1,139 people, mostly civilians, siege and about 250 others as hostages according to Israeli tallies. Palestinian leaders welcomed the adoption of the resolution saying it was a step in the right direction. This must be a turning point, Palestinian Ambassador Rahim Massour told the UNSC, holding back tears. This must signal the end of the assault and atrocities against our people. In a statement, the Palestinian Ministry of Foreign Affairs called on the UNSC member states to fulfil their legal responsibility to implement the resolution immediately. The ministry also stressed the importance of intensifying efforts to achieve a permanent ceasefire that extends beyond Ramadan, securing the, uh, the entry of aid, work in the, re the release of Palestinian prisoners held in Israeli jails, and prevent forced displacement of Palestinians. Hamas welcomed the resolution and said in a statement it reaffirms readiness to engage in immediate prison swaps on both sides. Yes, that's a good step in the right direction. I'm glad that they're willing to obviously release prisoners on both sides. There has been that talk, but obviously Israel and, um, uh, and especially the Prime Minister, especially the Prime Minister ben Netanyahu, are not interested in any kind of ceasefire. But the, the world people will want it. The pressure is it's ramping on it, and we need a cease. We need a ceasefire. France has called for more work on securing a permanent ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. The crisis is not over. Our council will have to remain mobilised and immediately get back to work after Ramadan, which ends in two weeks, and we'll have to establish a permanent ceasefire, the French ambassador Nicolas de Rivier said. The latest vote was held after Russia and China vetoed a US-sponsored resolution on Friday, which was supported an immediate and sustained ceasefire. The Russian ambassador Vasily uh, Nebariska said his country hopes Monday's resolution will be used in the interest of peace rather than uh, advancing the inhumane Israeli operation against Palestinians. I cannot believe this, but I have to agree with the Russian ambassador on this one. Uh, it is of fundamental importance that the UN Security Council for the first time is demanding the parties observe an immediate ceasefire, even if it's limited to the month of Ramadan, he said. Unfortunately, what happens after that remains unclear. Russia tried to push the use of the word permanent in regards to the ceasefire. It has complained that dropping the word could allow Israel to resume its military operations in the Gaza Strip at any moment, after Ramadan, which ends on April the 9th. We are disappointed that it did not make it through, he said. Yeah, I'm kind of disappointed that too, but uh, I'd like to think, yeah, that uh, yeah, with the, on the wording that um, I still think that they, even if it was a permanent ceasefire, I don't expect them to... to to hold on to uh, keep their word, Israel on the, on the situation. I mean, we want, um, we all want a, a, permanent, a sustained ceasefire, but um, I just feel like I, I feel like the ball is more in Israel's court than it is in Hamas's on this situation, guys. Yes, um, Hamas has its part to play in this as well, but Israel, ha Israel have the ones to, that can stop this. Israel are the ones who can stop this. And we know that they're the ones who could stop this, but it's down. It's really down to them. Yeah, we, we need to do this. But we'll have to obviously see as time passes how 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 this progresses. If if anything, hopefully this will turn into some kind of ceasefire. Let's hope so. And guys, while you are here, if you haven't already, please hit the like button and share it across social media so others are notified of this video. If you're not a subscriber to the channel, please consider subscribing. It really does help support the channel. And if you do, you might, uh, you might make Ollie there turn around and be very, very happy as well. Um, so consider consider subscribing for Ollie's sake, guys. Um, it would be greatly appreciated. So this next one, guys, is from the Association Press. This story dropped. Uh, 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 obviously, there's been other stories with regarding Donald Trump. But this one, um, this one I picked up, obviously, um, you may have seen from yesterday from the Association Press. So the headline is, the court agrees to pause the collection of Trump's massive civil fraud judgment if he puts up $175 million. So at the time of this recording, this has not, I have not seen an 
I did check again this morning. I've not seen an update to this particular court case as far as I'm aware. So there may be an update by the time you guys read this. So just for reference here. So obviously uh, Trump is in big doo-doo uh, at the moment. He is in a in a massive fraud judgment case. He uh, basically is at risk of losing all his possessions and belong uh, losing a lot of possessions and belongings if he doesn't stump up the money for it. But um, the court has agreed to pause the collection of basically raiding his home of, of these things if he can find $175 million. So where do you think he's going to find $175 million? Mm. Yeah, the clock is kind of ticking on uh, Trump. Um, and um, <clears throat> is it... You know, it's, it's easy for us to laugh and, and point fingers at Trump, but at the same time, this is man, this man is also still running for the running for uh, president of the United States, and he hasn't been taken off the ballot, um, and he could still become our, become president uh, of the U.S. regardless of how how we feel about him, and despite all these cases and things put are thrown in at him, he still seems to truck on truck on uh, through these, and when we just spoken about. Um, the, the US and President Biden and his position about what's happening with obviously in Israel and Gaza, that's hampering votes yeah for President Biden. That is affecting the Americans, believe it or not. Um, and some people, while they feel that they have to vote Biden in this situation, some don't want to just because of the uh, situation there as well, among uh, many other things. So. This is this, and among many other court cases, it seems to be going to be running, 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 that's for sure. So, a New York appeal court on Monday agreed to hold off the collection of the former President Donald Trump of more than $454 million of civil fraud judgment if he puts up the $175 million within 10 days. So, he's got nine days at the time of this recording. If Trump does, it will stop the clock on collection and prevent the state from seizing the Presumptive, the presumptive Republican presidential nominee assets while he appeals. The appeal courts also hold up for aspects of a trial judge ruling that he had barred Trump and his son Eric Trump and Donald Trump Jr. The family company executive vice president from serving in corporate leadership for several years. In all, the order was a significant victory for the Republican ex-president as he defends the real estate empire that vaulted him into public life. The development came just before the New York Attorney General, Lira James, a Democrat, was expected to initiate efforts to collect the judgment. Trump, who attended a separate hearing in his criminal hush money case in New York, held the ruling and said it would post, he would post a bond securing or cash to cover the $175 million sum in the civil case. Speaking at a courthouse hallway, Trump revisited uh, his off-state uh, complaints about the civil trial judge Urfa Ongaran and the penalty he imposed. Uh, penalty uh, he had imposed. What he's done is a uh, disservice and should never be allowed to happen again. Says Trump, who argued that the fraud case is discouraging business in New York. I don't think business in New York is is going to be discouraged by what's happening to you, uh, Mr. Trump. If I'm honest. James, meanwhile, noted that all judgments still stand, even if the collection is paused. Donald Trump is still facing accountability for his staggering fraud, office said in a statement. Trump's lawyers had pleaded for a state appeals courts to halt collection, claiming it was a practical impossibility to get an underwriter to sign off a bond for such a large sum, which grows daily because of interest. The Trump attorney had earlier proposed a $100 million bond, but an Apatel judge said, uh, had said no late last month. Uh, Monday's ruling came from a five-judge panel in the state immediate appeals court and called on the Apatil division, uh, where Trump is fighting to overturn Erdogan's February 16th decision. Trump's attorney, Elia Haber and Christopher Kreis, uh, characterized Monday's uh, ruling as a key first step. Signed with the Attorney General after a month-long civil trial, Erdogan found that Trump, his company and his top executive lied about his wealth on financial statements, conning bankers and insurers who did business with him. The statement valued Trump's penthouse for years as they thought it was nearly three times his actual size, for example. Trump and his co-defenders deny any wrongdoing, saying that the statements were actually low-balling his fortune, came with disclaimers and that weren't taken at face value by the institutes that lent to or insured him. The penthouse discrepancy, he said, was simply a mistake by subordinates. Sure they were. 
The one ordered Trump to pay $355 million plus interest. Some co-defendants, including Donald Trump uh, Jr. and Eric Trump, were ordered to pay far smaller amounts. Monday's ruling also puts on hold if the $175 million bond is posted. After James won the, Trump, uh, won the judgment, she didn't seek to enforce it uh, during a legal timeout for Trump, asking the appeals court for a reprieve from paying up. That period ended Monday, though. James could have, allow, could have decided to allow Trump more time. James told ABC News last month that if Trump didn't have the money to pay, she would seek, seek to seize his assets. She didn't detail the process or specify what holdings she meant, and her office had declined more recently to discuss its plans. Meanwhile, the office has filed notice of the judgment, a technical step towards potentially moving to collect. Trump maintained on social media on Friday that he has almost $500 million in cash, uh, but he said at a news conference on Monday he would like to be able to use some of uh, use some on his presidential one. He said that James and Erdogan, who is also a, Demo a Democrat, don't want me to take cash and use it for my campaign. If the penalty is ultimately upheld, the Attorney General could go after Trump's bank and investment accounts. There is also the possibility of going through a legal process to seize properties such as Trump Tower's penthouse, aircraft, Wall Street uh, office building or golf courses, and then seeking to sell them. But that could be complicated in Trump's case. Finding buyers for assets for these uh, magnitudes isn't something that doesn't happen overnight, noted uh, Stuart uh, Stalk, a real estate law prosecutor at Cardillo School of Law. Under New York law, filing an appeal generally doesn't hold off enforcement of a judgment, but there is an automatic pause if the person or entry posts a bond covering what's owed. Many defendants are able to get such a bond, but a judgment of this size are rare, said Joshua, a former federal prosecutor and now in private practice. What makes this one unusual is the subject of an enormous amount of money that has to come up with himself, Nefis said. The ex-president lawyers have said, uh, have said underwrites wanting 120% of the judgment and wouldn't accept real estate as collateral, which would mean tying up over $557 million in cash, stocks and other liquid assets. And Trump's company needs some left over to run the business, his attorneys have said. They've asked for an appeal court to freeze collection without posting a bond. The Attorney General's office objected, uh, saying they hadn't explored every option for covering the amount. The appeals court chose a middle ground by requiring Trump to put money, uh, but not but lowering the amount. Nefika said. So yeah, the clock is kind of ticking on him to to find to find something uh, because if he doesn't, he's going to basically start getting his assets getting seized. Um, but they are doing every they are looking literally looking at every single crook and cranny to try and delay and differ on all of this as much as possible so, um, as much as possible so they will try everything to delay and kick this can down the road guys it's not gonna uh, this among other cases they're not gonna go away but the only way he can make them go away is literally by becoming the president because when he becomes president he can basically say you can't touch me anymore is basically what he's gonna be implying so <sighs> Yeah, whether he will whether he will succeed or not is another thing, obviously. But um, yeah, the situation around Trump is uh, not going away anytime soon, guys. Speaking of Trump, as a man who is very desperate for money, it's only fitting, guys, that we that we hear uh, from President uh, former President Donald Trump appealing to a certain person for help for money. I am Comrade Alex Jones. I have a special message for our Supreme Commander Vladimir Putin from America's former president and future Soviet puppet, Donald Trump. Izalkimi-Amerikancami. <laughs> A ja grijazno je dermo, na kotoro je, ja nadejo se vi nikog da ne nastupit, no ja bi molil še, kto bi vi prislali me dengi, v kotorih ja tako čeno nuzdaju se. I po etomu so moj lider, ja vsegda sleduju za toboj, ja ne verem nikomu krome tebi, ja bojus toliko toga, što glupi je, 
Amerikanci skeptičesky odnesu se k moje iluzi bogatstva. Jestli ja ne smogu najti dengi dlja zaloga po apeliaci, ja umoljaju vas, podzalu ista, pomogite mne, ser, se spasibo. I am loyal, comrade Alex Jones, and this has been a special message from comrade Donald Trumpski. All hail our supreme leader, Vladimir Putin. Yes, all oh, hail. <laughs> Um, at the time of this recording, I'm not sure if the uh, the Russian president has obliged to the obliged to it, guys. So I'm just going to put that out there. So I cannot confirm or deny whether or not um, <coughs> uh, uh, the, pre the Russian president has done that, guys. Guys, just before we go to the next story, if you can, if you want to financially support me in the work I do here on this channel, you can do so by becoming a YouTube member for as little as 99p or join for the 299 membership where you get early access to content once I've uh, done content and uploaded it onto YouTube. And I do take an hour or so before I make it available to members as I just want to make some monetization. It's all perfectly all right as well. Um, but you guys can get access to it early if you become a 299 Snowflake Corporal there. And obviously any... Um, any uh, memberships really does make a difference. Uh, other ways, if you want to financially support me, you can do so by buying me a coffee or joining me on Patreon. Uh, links to those are in the description as well. So if you wanted to, to if you wanted YouTube to take a less of a cut uh, from me, you can do so from those links in the description down below as well. Um, as well, and access to Patreon gets you uh, also obviously becoming a member on Patreon gets you access to uh, extra content. As well as uh, usual content that is free for mem Patreon members on there, so you get even so you get lots of cool stuff there, um, and also feel free to check out my Rumble as uh, Rumble page as well, which has lots of uh, world news content that I drop on there every Monday to Friday. There's content on there as well, so feel free to check out all that stuff, guys. And thank you to everyone who has financially supported me in any way, shape, or form, whether it's members, super chats, Patreons, or buy me a coffee. All those are greatly appreciated. Isn't that right, Ollie? Ollie should be a lot happier about this. Uh, hopefully, Ollie will be a lot happier about this later on, guys. So this next story, guys, um, I've haven't uh, I've covered very very many short stories with regards to this, but this is the first time I'm actually going to be able to have a proper uh, real discussion about this. So this article is from Channel News Asia, that's CNA for those who are referenced, the link for it is in the description down below. So I've been starting to use them as a means to finding more news stories with regards to what's happening in Asia. Uh, so for those of you who have been following the short videos of mine, you know that uh, the Philippines and Chinese have been having lots of disputes in the South China Sea. And uh, re a lot of things recently with regards to South China Sea have been using water cannons to fire at Philipp uh, Philippines. Basically, they seem to be using their aggression, uh, basically aggressively trying to, s not so much, I would say, going into uh, total engagement. But there's a great deal of intimidation from uh, Chinese, from the Chinese forces, uh, in and around Philippe, uh, the Philippines uh, Sea area here. Um, China think that they are, they have access right away and access in their waters, and they kind of don't. And yeah, this has been an, uh, a, tug, a tugging of back and forth here for quite a while. So the headline here is obviously for the Fili Philippines say Chinese envoy summoned over the aggressive actions off the reef. Like I said, this has been going on for a long time. If you've been following me on the shorts, uh, follow the shorts videos, guys, you know that these two have been going at it in the South China Sea. So let's read something into this, guys. So Malia, the Philippines, said on Monday the 25th they had summoned a Chinese envoy over the aggressive actions by the South, by the China Coast Guard over and other vessels near a reef off the South Asian Asian country coast. While Beijing lodged its own complaint. The deputy foreign minister from the two countries later held a phone call in which China urged Milano to pull back from the brink and stop providing provoking trouble at the sea, Beijing said. So Beijing and Milano have a long history of marine time territorial disputes in the South China Sea. And there has been repeated confrontations between their vessels and the near dispute reliefs in recent months. The latest incident took place on Saturday near the second Thomas Shoal at the Sprafri Islands during a regular Philippine mission to resupply Filippo troops garrisoned at the, on the BRP Serena Module, a ground navy ship. The Philippines said that a China Coast Guard blocked its supply vessel and damaged it with a water cannon, injuring three soldiers. The China Coast Guard has defended its actions, describing them as lawful regulation, interception and expulsion of a foreign vessel that tried to forcefully intrude into Chinese waters. And this is the thing, like, 
China are claiming that 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 the seas are theirs, while the Philippines are claiming, well, that it's always been our territory. So this is a an ongoing issue here. And the thing is, is that then the problem is, is that China can be a bigger bully because they have the 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 navy, they have the bad power. Sorry, excuse me. And the Philippines, they do have the backing of the U.S. if if things es if things get too escalated as well. So the Philippines can kind of be a bit bolsterous as well. So they don't they're not going to uh, take it lying down either. So Melania uh, Melina conveyed its strongest protest against the aggressive uh, actions undertaken by the Chinese. Uh, China's Coast Guard and Chinese Maritime Militia against the rotation and resupply missions undertaken by the Philippines in Elegant Seoul, the Department of Foreign Affairs said on Monday. Using the Philippo name of the second Thomas Shell, it said the foreign embassy in Beijing also lodged similar protests with the Chinese Foreign Ministry. In his departure to Philippe stress, among others, that China has no right to be in the Agol Shoal, the Foreign Affairs Department has said. The Philippines demand that Chinese vessels leave the vicinity of Angan Shoal and the Philippines' exclusive economic zone immediately. Um, so they, they clearly have stated that the, the, these areas or waters belong to them and they should not be anywhere near them. If I mispronounce any of the names, I apologise, but this has basically been, as it said, it's just um, not going away anytime soon. On Monday, China's embassy in the Philippines said he had complained to Melania of what is called illegal intrusion of the Southeast Asian country ships into its waters. In a later phone call, Chinese Vice Foreign Minister uh, Zheng said that our bilateral relations were currently at a crossroads. The Philippines must pay serious attention to China's concerns, pull back from the brink and return as soon as possible to the correct track to resolving differences with China through negotiation and consultations, Zheng said. Second Thomas Shoal is about 200 kilometers from the western Philippines island of Padawan and more than a thousand kilometers from China's nearest mainland uh, landmass, Huddins Island. So we're talking, you can tell the difference here, like 2,000 kilometers away uh, from the Philippines and a thousand from China. Like, it is the same location, it is the same location where there's been recent collisions between vessels belonging to both countries as well as water cannons by the China uh, Coast Guard. And China claims almost to almost the entire South China Sea, brushing off rivals claims that other countries, including the Philippines, have an international ruling that is assertion and has no legal basis. The United States, which has a new, uh, mutual defense pact with Melania, has denounced the attack. It comes days after the U.S. Uh, Secretary of State Antony Blinken said the United States uh, stood by its ironclad commitments to defend longtime ally the Philippines against armed attacks in the South China Sea. Philippine Defense Secretary uh, Gilbert Toronto on Monday challenged Beijing to seek aberration, in which they said it was the best way of solving their legal disputes sustainably. That's why I don't, uh, they don't like it, Tito, Tito World told reporters. Relations between Melania and Beijing have cooled under Philippine President Fernandez Marcos as he seeks a deepening cooperation with the US and the regional neighborhoods, while standing up to China's aggression towards Philippine vessels. Chinese and Philippine officials agreed in January on the needs for a closer dialogue to deal with the marine time emergencies in the South China Sea, including the Second Thomas Shoal. Melania said on Monday that China's aggression, uh, aggressive actions call into question its sincerity in lowering the tension and promoting peace and stability in the South China Sea. Despite the attack, Philippine officials said the damaging vessels and the Coast Guard escort ships came to its aid later in an in deployed rigorous hull inflatable boats to deliver its cargo and personnel to the Filippo outpost. Filippo soldiers stationed on the shoal live on a crumbled RSB Serena mandate and require frequent resupplies for food, water and other necessities as well as transport for personal rotation. Apart from supplies and equipment, the Filippo military said six, uh, six naval personnel who were delivered to the BRP Serena Maldo on Saturday replacing one soldier who was recently evacuated on medical grounds. The damaged supply boat and its escorts sailed back as part of part after completing their mission, a task force had said. So we, we've obviously, I've covered this in several short stories, and this is China obviously flexing their muscles in the South China Sea. I'm glad that actually the US are basically saying they're keeping their commitments to obviously, I'm glad that Anthony Blinken commented on the, on the situation that's been happening here because this has been going on for recent months. And while for the Philippines are trying to be... Um, negotiating peacefully about the situation it's pretty clear that well you know they just they just really don't care what um they honestly don't care what um 
what 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 the Philippines are saying from China's perspective. They're still going to keep doing what they're doing, and it's extremely frustrating to say the least. But um, I'm not quite sure how this situation is going to be resolved because the Fili the Philippines own uh, the, it's their sea areas, their international waters. Um, it's been recognised internationally by their waters, but China doesn't care. You know, China thinks they own much more than that of the sea, um, just because they're China. Um, so I'm not sure how they, how this is going to be dis this this issue is going to be disputed. But there's going to be more there's going to be more uh, confrontations of, uh, in, as time passes. But I'm not sure how this is going to be resolved at the moment. Um, I really don't know, guys. So this next one, guys, is from France 24. It's um, a little bit regarding, uh, it's just a small piece, obviously, from them regarding uh, what happened uh, in Moscow a while ago, guys. So Macron has said the, the ISIS branch carried out in Moscow's attack group that had attempted to attack, had attempted attacks in France. So there was, the, so for those who aren't aware, there was a, an ISIS attack in Moscow that uh, killed uh, several people. ISIS had claimed responsible responsibility for the attack. Ukraine, as far as they're concerned, had no part in the attack whatsoever. Um, but Russia obviously looking to blame Ukraine for some reason in the, in, in the attack. Um, the French President Emmanuel Macron on Monday said France had information on the Islamic State. ISIS carried out Friday's attack in the Moscow Concert Hall, warning Russia against exploiting the attack by blaming it on Ukraine. Um, Putin has acknowledged ISIS responsibility for this. Russia, and they have uh, that, but they still say Ukraine is part have been a part of this attack as well. So it is they are still trying to use it as a as a wedge to for the people to blame Ukraine for it as well. So even though they have they have specifically acknowledged it, Putin has acknowledged it. I've seen reports that he has acknowledged it. Um, it still doesn't change the fact that it's still was done by the Islamic State. Um, now, Macron is obviously saying that these are the same ISIS Islamic State that have tried to carry out attacks in France, and they have unsadly had one or two attacks over the few years here in France, in France as well. Um, but uh, I, I don't think there's any, any anything that Macron's saying here is wrong, if I'm honest. So France has intelligence saying that it was the in intensity of Islamic State that planned the attack that carried out than I carried it out. Macron told reports after a trip on the South uh, French South American region of uh, Guyana. He added that his particular group made several attempts at attacks on our own soil. Macron, however, warned uh, Russia against any exploration of the attack, saying it would be seen our encounter productive of Russia to use this context to try and turn it against Ukraine. ISIS has claimed responsibility for the Friday evening attack on Moscow, in which killed 37 people. But Moscow has refused to uh, comment on the claim, with security services and President Vladimir Putin suggested that perpetrators might have been linked to his adversary. Well, I've seen some uh, news articles counteract this claim, saying that they have accepted that Putin and, and Russia have accepted that it was ISIS. But So there are some conflicting stories on the matter. The concert Paris have been offered Russian, had offered Russian security services intense cooperation, adding that there would be contact on technical and ministerial levels rather than direct talks with Putin. The French leader has not spoken with Putin since trying a series of phone calls in 2022 to talk him down from his invasion in Ukraine. We'll see how the contact involves and whether it comes in the coming days or weeks to justify a personal conversation with Quonset. So he's trying to find some kind of dialogue with Russia on, on this situation here. But um, if I'm honest, I don't think yeah, Russia really cares what, 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 what the French have to have to say or even offer for all that matter I, I honestly don't think they care if i'm absolutely honest guys um at this point so the next one i've got for you guys is from the kia post so we're going into uh going into the final trade into uh stuff in ukraine uh in the war in ukraine guys so this one is the kia for claiming a possible hit on another russian ship on march the 23rd attack on crimea so ukrainian intelligence indicates that damage to a russian ship Yamal is confirmed with critical damage observed and a hole in the upper deck causing it is listed to starboard. Um, so they have had been using, one of the things that Ukraine have been using, even though they don't have a navy anymore in the Black Sea, but they have severely crippled um, Russia's uh, fleets in the Black Sea um, by using many various specialized drones to take out a lot of them. And uh, they've caused a great deal of damage to um Excuse me, two Russian uh, Russian ships in in the Black Sea, which is uh, 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 is one place they are doing uh, sustainable damage against uh, against Russia in in this conflict, and it, 
and they even took, sunk their flag their flagship uh, as flagship in in the black sea as well so they are continuing to cause a lot of havoc in the, in the in the black sea that is for sure uh, they cause so much havoc actually now that they're able to get uh, grain out of the black out from out from their coast out into the out of the black sea as well because um because uh, Russian fleets can't patrol the Black Sea because of fears of these drone strikes uh, from Ukraine, and they're very almost difficult, almost near to next impossible to um, to target them. And the Russian Navy commander was sacked from his job because so many ships have been sunk at the hands of, of Ukraine and their tactics that they were using as well. So, the spokesperson for the Ukrainian naval forces, the VMS, Adamo Pushkis, revealed. On Radio Soska, that during the March 23rd attack on Crimea, another Russian vessel, the Ivan Kozas, may have sustained the damage. Preskus clarified that the information concerning damage to Russian ships required through verification, and thus the VMS presented it with caution. Just this morning, I've confirmed damage to both ships, Yamal and Alfredsk, he stated. There are also concerns regarding the potential damage to the Ivan Kozas. We are currently working to verify this information, yet. The Ivan Kuskos is a Russian medium reconnaissance ship tasked with operations in and near far uh, sea zones as well as oceanic regions. Its responsibilities include communication support, fleet management and conducting radio reconnaissance and electronic welfare. Named after Vice Admiral uh, Ivan Kuzas, who led the intelligence department into the main staff of the of the USSR Navy from the 1979 to 1879, the ship played a crucial role in Russian naval operations. The Kiev Post has reached out to the main directors of intelligence, the HUR, for the assessment of the likelihood of the kind of as being hit at the time of publication. A response is currently pending. It's not the first instance of Ukrainian reports uh, regarding potential damage to the ship. In May 2023, the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense released footage captured by a marine time drone moments before an impact with a Russian vessel. Yeah, I've seen some of those, uh, some of those footages just, uh, just before they've hit as well. Um, devastating damage. The Russian Defense Ministry claimed that Ukrainian unmanned speedboat attacks attacked this warship in the Black Sea near the approach to the Boskov Strait. All enemy boats were neutralized by fire from the standard armament of a Russian ship 140 kilometers northeast of the Boskos, a Russian report had said. According to the footage released by the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense, a naval kamikaze drone struck the Ivan Koskos in 2023. Um, I'm not going to play it there just for uh, just for safekeeping. Puskas added that the extent of damage to Yamal and other ships are still being assessed. Natalia Hamakus, a spokesperson for Ukraine's Operational Command South, OC South, reported that the strike on Yamal and Asfos had been significantly impacted by Russian logistics and military management. In the temporary occupied cesspool Svatopol on March 23rd, uh, the 13th uh, ship repair plant uh, of the Black Sea Fleet was targeted, where the Yamal was moored among other vessels. The HUR reported that the damage to the ship was severe. The HUR disclosed that damage to the ship was critical, with a hole in the upper deck causing it uh, at least to starboard. The occupiers are actively pumping water out of the damaged vessel, which played a role in the annexation of Crimea and had been under repairs from 2017 to 2023, the report said. Ukraine claimed on Sunday that they had targeted two Russian military vessels stationed in Crimea, the occupied peninsula, during overnight strikes amid another wave of intense Russian aerial assaults. Ukrainian armed forces, the AFU, reportedly successfully hit the amphibious landing ship Azamal and Yossos, along with the communication centre and various infrastructure sites of the Black Sea Fleet, as stated by the AFU Strategic Communication Centre on Sunday. Officials installed by Moscow on the peninsula, which uh, Russia annexed in 2024, claimed that their forces repelled a significant Ukrainian aerial assault on late Saturday night. Describing it as the most sustainable attack in recent memory, mythical Rachevichko, if I mispronounce any names, I apologise. The Russian-appointed governor of Sesspool mentioned in Telegram post that a 65-year-old man was killed and four others were injured. However, he made no mention of any damage to Russian warships. Footage circulating on social media depict a powerful explosion in the city, sending a fireball and a pun of black smoke into the sky, accompanied by what seemed to be Russian air defence intercepting incoming project, project, uh, projectiles. And since the beginning of the Russian full-scale invasion, Ukraine has claimed to have destroyed approximately a third of the Russian Black Sea fleet, although some nighttime attacks utilizing sea-based drones armed with explosives. As I said, armed basic drones with explosives, which they've been using to to take out some of the um, take out some of these um, take out some of these ships, guys. And like I said, Ukraine doesn't really have a navy, and when um, they 
and it was kind of already and you know what they had left was kind of destroyed at the start of the war because they had such a massive fleet within the black sea already rushed up but they have done damage to to russia's navy without a shadow of a doubt so that is one one battle that they are in my opinion are doing better of on sea than they are doing on land at the moment i would say so let's have a look guys what's happening in the kiev independent so uh, this one here from the Defence Ministry, more than 2,000 Russian missiles have been downed over Ukraine since the start of the all-out war. So Ukrainian armed forces have shot more than 2,000 cru cruise and ballistic uh, Russian missiles since the beginning of the full-scale invasion, the Defence Ministry had reported. Another two ballistic missiles launched from occupied Crimea were shot down in Kiev over March 25th. Following multiple explosions, according to the Air Force, the breeze fell on Somolovsky and Preskrit districts, damaging a three-storey building in the latter. At least two people have been reportedly injured and eight others suffer from the shock. The rescue operation is ongoing. Moscow has launched over 8,000 missiles and more than 4,600 drones against Ukraine as of February 2022. Since the all-out war, said Yuri Inikt, a spokesperson for the Ukrainian Air Force. That's a result of a titanic work of Ukrainian air defenders. Thousands of lives were saved by the modern air defense systems provided by our partners. The ministry wrote on X, reported on the devastating target. So they're all the air defense systems that have been provided by uh, European and American allies have made a difference to people's lives. It really, really has. Over the past week, Moscow launched uh, several large-scale attacks on Ukrainian cities, including energy infrastructure. Around 190 missiles, 140 Shalad-type drones, and 700 aerial bombs were used, President Volodymyr Zelensky said on March the 24th. Local authorities reported multiple injured and killed civilians. Ukrainian officials urged Western allies to provide Kiev with more weapons, including air defense systems, to protect Ukraine from regular strikes. And we're just going to have a look here, guys, to see uh, what else has been happening here. Uh, so Russia has attacked four communities in Sumy Oblast. That's um, there uh, on the map for those who are reference. Russia attacked uh, border areas in settlements in Sumy Oblast on the 25th of March, uh, firing five times, causing at least 11 explosions. Sumy Oblast military administration reported the communities of Novosovgol, Shoshki, Shemogorich, Buka, and Sertovich were targeted. The Russian military struck the communities using artillery fire and motor shelling. No casualties or damage in civilian infrastructure were reported. That's good. Some on blast have been experiencing daily shelling attacks from the Russian border. Due to recent escalated attacks, Russia, Ukrainian authorities evacuated more than 4,500 residents from 22 villages in Sumy on blast. That's good to know. Uh, another one here. This one is from today. Ukraine shot down 12 Shalar drones overnight. So overnight, guys, they, these are... Iranian-made Shalahar drones, guys, that um, Iran have been Iran have been supplying these drones to aid um, Russia in its war effort against Ukraine. So that's the description of it, guys. There for there. So Ukraine shot down uh, all 12 Kamikaze drones launched by Russia overnight. The Air Force said in its morning update today, that's March 26. In post on Telegram, the Air Force said that the drones have been launched from the Cap Karida in Russian-occupied Crimea. Along with the two S-300 anti-aircraft guided missiles in the direction of Donetsk Onblast, the Air Force did mention uh, did mention whether it had intercepted the missiles. The air attacks were repelled by mobile fire groups of the Defense Forces of Ukraine in the Molotov and Kalakiv region. The post reads, all 12 drones were shot down thanks to successful combat work. The attack came hours after Kiev was once again targeted by Russian missiles with air defenses intercepting over two over the city on the morning. Soled Polko, head of the Kiev military uh, military administration said in the post on Telegram that debris from intercepted missiles have fallen in the city postcard district, damaging a non-residential building. The Kiev city administ military administration said that out of the 10 victims, two people were wounded and hospitalized, and the remaining eight suffered from shock. Uh, let's just see if they've got anything else here. There's been another one here. Can we look at one more here before we look at deep state map? Or oh, maybe one more after this. So Russia has claimed three injured in an attack in Belorok, uh, in Belorok here as well. This was also this morning, um, at the time of this recording. An Ukrainian attack on Russia's Belgrad Oblast overnight injured three people, the governor, uh, Goskovich, claimed today. The Kiev Independent could not verify the claims, and Ukraine does not usually comment on alleged attacks on Russian soil. According to the governor, the town of Gosko, located some 20 kilometers, 12.5 uh, miles from the border of Ukraine's semi Oblast, were reportedly struck by Ukrainian fire. The news comes days after Russians' anti Kremlin missiles reportedly broke into Russia's Koskis and Balorok Oblast, resulting in clashes with the Russian government forces. 
Gladlock and other Russian officials have repeatedly claimed over recent months that the city of Belwok and its surroundings have come under attack by Ukrainian forces. Three people were allegedly injured in the attack, taken to hospital there. So there has been some fire potentially going into Russian territory there, guys. I'm just seeing if there's any other any other stories here. Uh, we've covered that one already. Um, let's just see, just double checking here. So uh, in regards to the terrorist attack, SBU chief charged with abstainer in terrorism by Moscow court. So Security Bureau of Ukraine SBU chief uh, Vladimir Moskov was charged with abstainer in terrorism by a Moscow court on March 26th. The court claimed Moscow had committed a crime under the Act of Clause B of Part 3 of Article 205 of the Criminal Code of the Russian Federation had been placed on federal and interstate warning list. According to the independent Russian media outlet Muskas, the charges relate to a number of comments he made during interviews in recent days that hinted that the SBU's involvement in attacks on Russia's Black Sea Fleet and Crimea Bridge and several oil refineries in Russia. According to Mesdusa, the charges relate to a number of comments made during interviews in recent days um, and the SBU's involvement in attacks on Russian Black Sea Fleets, the Crimea Bridge and several oil refineries. Speaking on national TV on the 25th of March, Moscow said Russians should expect more attacks like these that have targeted the country's oil production, but that the nature of the strikes will change because Ukraine never repeats itself. He also discussed the Crimean Bridge, which is heavily damaged in the Ukrainian strike in October 2022 and July 2023 in plans at first convened in March 2022, Moscow said. When the structure is fully resolved, Russia will likely use the bridge once again for weapons supplies, but implies that Russia, Ukraine plans to carry out another attack. Everything has time, he said. I do believe they will engage at some point. The um, um, I do believe at some point, guys, they will engage on that uh, Crimean bridge at some point because it is one of the longest bridges there, and it is it is a target and the target that they should that Ukraine should try to. Uh, exploit uh, without a doubt guys so just before we wrap things up here guys because this is uh, all I have left uh, we're gonna have a quick look at the deep state map for you guys uh, the link is in the description if you want to provide any support uh, for the work they do on the deep state map you're more than welcome to do so you simply follow the link in the description it will give you an uh, option if you wanted to donate and support the work they do here so this is the current update here, guys, is the 25th of March at 21.43 uh, is the time of the latest update here, uh, positions here. It doesn't look like much has changed in terms of the battlefield since we last covered the deep state map. But if we just, uh, what we'll do is just pull it back a few times to see, has there been any changes, any real movement? It doesn't appear to be any real movement from the last couple of days here that we have seen here. Uh, have we seen any movement, real movement here? Let's just do a couple of days here. Uh, two, three, oh, wait a minute, what's that? Let's go back a second. So, doesn't look like there's been, there may have been engagements here and here. Uh, engagements, sorry, you can't see my cursor, can you? So, Veska, Noskoviska area, there may have been engagements here. Looks like changing engagement positions here, they look like they tried to break through uh, from here. This was obviously um, from uh, several days ago here. Um, obviously, from Avika, they've pushed quite forward here. So, um, there's always been. Uh, so, it looks like they're trying to make some engagements down at the bottom here from Ola, uh, from Alavika. So, I can't say the name. Nosko Alavika here. That looks like they may be trying to make some gains from there. Obviously, Alavika here, as you guys know, they took the um, they took the city a while ago. Has there been many much progress here? Uh, it doesn't look like just pulling back. So they have made some gains over the last over the last several days. Uh, if I pull back, yeah, in a, in, the, in the last couple of days, they have made some ground still here in this area here. Um, so they are still pushing in this direction here. In here, there has been talk of a rush, a major Russian. I have heard talks of a Russian offensive in summer. Have there been any kind of movement here? Um, there has been some movement here from Konomov into Ainoveskis, heading toward Chatsky Var here. So they have been making some grounds here as well. So there has been some movement. Uh, some ground has been gained without doubt from Russia's perspective here. So 
obviously that's and doesn't appear to be much movement at the top of there at the moment but um without a shadow of a doubt obviously the um they are losing ground in the don i think it's fair to say guys that the donetsk region um is losing they are losing ground in the donetsk region in terms of the conflict here in russia uh in the ukraine war without so without so they are slowly losing territory there as we speak um so they're struggling to hold on so it looks like putin's obviously looking to push more and more into the donetsk region there um which is why more than ever they need supplies more supplies and more weapons and i've talked about the conscription that they need to change their conscription law in ukraine in order to i generally do believe they need to change that conscription law guys because they need more bodies um they need more bodies and then i think they need to get some younger men because um you know at least down to 21 i think it was 26 i think their conscription law was when we last talked about it so i think that's something they need to change they need to get more bodies in without a shadow of a doubt. I know Macron talked about uh, bringing, you know, getting his own, uh, was kind of pulled back on his comments about right, French forces being in there. But I totally get why, why Macron feels for the way he feels about what's happening in Ukraine because this will be the big, this will not be the end of it, um, is what is the point he's making. And I totally understand that point of view, guys. But we have reached the end of the world's news round, guys. What did you make of some of the stories we covered today? We talked about Sudan. We talked about the war in Gaza, the UN resolution there. Trump's civil court uh, situation that's still happening between the Philippines and China in the South China Sea. Macron on ISIS. ISIS attack on Moscow and the current affairs here in the war in Ukraine. What did you guys make of some of these stories? Let me know your thoughts down in the comment section down below. If you've watched all the way through, great. Thank you very, very much. I greatly appreciate it. But just before you go, guys, if you can, if you haven't already, please hit the like button. We greatly appreciate it. Do it for Ollie here. He will be a lot happier if you do. He will be a lot happier if you hit that like button, guys. He will be a lot happier if you do so say goodbye ollie we'll be back he'll be back as myself will be on the next live stream there if you haven't already please hit that like button we greatly appreciate it share it across social media so others are notified of this video and subscribe because it really does help support the channel guys subscribing really does help support the channel gets more eyes on the on the work that i'm doing here and i know yeah that there are many many people out there who are not subscribed but watch my content so please subscribe consider subscribing because it really does help and if you want to financially support me and the work that I do here, you can go, you can do that by becoming a YouTube member for as little as 99p, or you can join me on Rumble or Patreon for exclusive content there as well. So thank you all so much for watching, and I hope to catch you all very, very soon.